Um, so as you can see, Oshiday's event is develop your own generative adversarial network and introduction to GANs with Keras. Um, and we have the wonderful Umberto here who will um, hold the talk for us. Thanks a lot for your time. Um, and guys, at the end, uh, there will be a Q&A session so you can see the join link for the Slido. So please post your questions in there. Um, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session um, and uh, we will post the current question into the chat. So um, please consider to write your questions into the Slido, not in the Zoom chat. Um, okay, and that's basically all I wanted to say before the session. So yeah, I think Umberto, you can take over if you want to. And yeah. I just uh, stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Okay, thank you very much. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice being here. So I thought that, um, let me share first, <clears throat> do this way. Uh, let me first share the, uh, the screen. And, uh, and now you should see my uh, PowerPoint, right? Okay, the first thing that I would like to, to, to tell you is that I prepare a, a GitHub repository that you can access. And I wanted just to show you briefly what's in there so that you can go there and, and look at the different things. So let me just show you what is in there and let me share them. Just the repository. So you should now see my, my browser, is that correct? Very good. So this is the repository and you will see that um, you have several things. One thing that I prepared for you that you can have a look at is a PDF. I, I try to write down what I'm going to tell you today. So if you if you download, you can go here and download this PDF. Um, and I'll show you, maybe I'll show you this way. So if you just click it, you can, if you know GitHub, you can go here and click this download button. Maybe I can make it bigger so that it's easier to see. And I try really to explain you everything about here that you can take and read it and, uh, and just to, in case you're interested. And there are also, I try to give you a um, few, few code snippets that you can have a look at just to understand how, how you can develop your first, the first game. Okay. So everything you should find here, everything that I'm going to tell you today. That's the first thing. So then I also, and we will look at that briefly later on, I also, uh, in the code folder, I have several things. One of that is this, this uh, notebook that you can have a look. We will have a look at that together, uh, that where I try really to explain you how to develop. And it's unfortunately, this, the browser is not really behaving now. I don't know why, but you, we will look at that together so that you have an idea, but you can take the example run it and try it yourself and play with it and then use different data sets. And uh, it should be relatively easy if you have a bit of experience with, uh, uh, with Keras. Um, so you find here in the code folder, you find here in the description, you find all the, all the description about what is what and what file you can use. So you can go there and play with it. So you can, um, you can even run it on Google Colab. Keep in mind, I'll tell you that later, but keep in mind that there are like, it takes a while to run those, those networks. So if you do it on your laptop, it may take easily hours. Okay, so just, just for you to, as, as a warning, if you, get, if you want to get some nice results, but we will look at that later a bit. So um, that's the first thing. So I, I think that uh, you sent also the link to the, to the GitHub, right? And the, perfect, okay, very good. So. So we can start and look at the, uh, so if anyone has any question, you just don't be, just, just, just say something and I, I can, uh, uh, I can answer the questions. Now you could see, you should see the slides full screen now. Okay. Now, so who am I? So maybe just, just for you. So I, I wrote a book about deep learning and as probably Leander has told you, so I'm a, develop, I'm a developer expert in machine learning that I worked with Google with workshops uh, and talks. So if, uh, if anyone has any question about TensorFlow, Keras, feel free to get in touch. I'm happy to answer all the questions that you may have and uh, about projects, about things that you may may have, so just, just get in touch if you, if you need anything. Okay, so general adversarial networks. So the, I think that the best way to understand them is to use 
uh, an example that has nothing to do with neural networks. And the example, the story is the following. Imagine that there is someone that is a painter and we will call her Susie that wants to learn to play, uh, to, to paint like Van Gogh. Okay, so she wants to learn to produce paintings that are as similar as possible to Van Gogh paintings. And she doesn't know exactly how to do that. So she thinks that maybe I can use some help and I, she finds a friend that we will call Mary that uh, uh, she will try to help her pointing out the mistakes that she will do. Okay, so they, they, they have no idea. So they started from scratch. Uh, Susie the painter have no idea about how to paint uh, and Mary the critic has no idea how to recognize one Van Gogh from one Monet or any other painter. Okay, so they start and they decide that they want to, uh, to try to get to the point where uh, Susie the painter can actually produce a Van Gogh painter, uh, Van Gogh painting. So the first step, what they think is the following. Susie can, can decide and say, look, what I can do is that I can just paint something. It's clearly fake because I painted it, not Van Gogh, right? And then I can show it to, uh, to Mary that she's trying to, to see, okay, is fake or not, depending on what the ability of Mary and maybe the ability of Susie, uh, right? Um, she can tell Susie, the painter, yeah, you know, the colors are not right and the proportions are clearly not right. This is surely not a Van Gogh. And uh, in this way, slowly Susie can become better because Mary can tell her the colors are not right. And in the next painting, uh, Susie can actually try to improve on that aspect. Okay, so, and this, this kind of is the first step. Now, of course, this kind of feedback helps only the painter. Right, because only only Susie can get better, but Mary, the critic, will not be able to get much better because nobody is helping her in learning how to recognize real from fakes. So what Mary uh, can do is that she can actually train uh, and try to understand what are the differences between true paintings, true I mean like real Van Gogh paintings and fake paintings that are clearly fake. So produced by someone else or that she knows are fake. And she can try to learn the differences, maybe studying, maybe using different approaches. So in the first step is the painter. So Susie that profits from it and gets better. And in the second step is Mary that is actually trying, looking at real and fake painting, try to find out what the differences are so that she can go back in step one and help Susie uh, with the learning to get better at painting things. And the idea here is that by doing step one, step two, step one, and then step two, and then step one, and then step two, enough times, the hope is that Mary and Susie get better together at the, until they reach a point where Susie can produce such beautiful paintings that Mary is not able to distinguish them from fakes anymore. Okay. And this is actually the main idea about adversarial learning. And it's called adversarial because you have those two entities here that would be one is Susie, one is Mary. So one is the, um, the painter, one is the critic that try to actually do two things. One is trying to produce a fake and the other is trying to recognize that is a fake, right? Um, and, uh, and this is why it's called adversarial, okay? Because they're kind of trying to reach opposite goals, the two. Uh, person, so that would be the critic Mary and and Susie, and and you can think about this approach is can be used for example when you see you probably have seen websites like uh, uh, where like there are networks that produce very realistic faces, right? Uh, or um, those kind of things are actually working exactly in this way, with the difference that the, the those neural networks are, are not producing fake Van Gogh paintings, but are trying to produce fake faces of people or, or similar things. And then you have a second network that try to tell the first network that, oh no, you know what? It's not really looking real. And, and, and so they try to get better together. Now, this is just a, a story. So uh, I think that it's, it's better to try to put it now in a more um, formal kind of neural network uh, language that we can translate in, in the code, okay? so. First thing first, so uh, how you measure that uh, a painting, for example, is fake or not fake, 
right? So you have a painting and you're saying, oh, I want to measure that it's fake or not fake. A person would probably look at it and say, you know what, I think it's fake, or you know what, I think it's real. But when you're talking about neural network, and maybe some of you have already seen this, this loss function is called the cross entropy, is a measure, is, is a typical loss function that you use in a classification problem that tells you a bit, if you want, if you don't, if you have never seen it, you can think about intuitively something like it tells you how much difference is your input from a real or a fake output, right? And the idea is that you have, for example, uh, you have this one. Uh, this one is the class label. For example, you could have, for example, one that could be, for example, a real painting, right? And you could have zero that is a fake painting, okay? That, for example, is uh, what epsilon is. And this one, the Y with the head, would be the probability that your neural network or your model, whatever it is, is thinking about the input, okay? So if, if I know that some of you study computer science, you may have had like machine learning classes. So you know that a model has an output that in a binary classification just gives you the probability of the input of being a one or two classes, okay? So, this is just to tell you what kind, what is CE that you will see on the next slide. And uh, you will need that because we will use that in Keras to actually, you, we will use that in, in, for this one. So the critic, you remember that in this, for example, in this image here, in this kind of step one, Mary the critic have to tell the painter Susie, it's, you know what, your painting is real, it looks real or it looks fake. And this looks real or looks fake is actually done by giving an output to one or zero. And how she get better, this loop, of course, is done as typical in neural network by minimizing a loss function. And this loss function is this cross entropy. Okay. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, I think that in the chat, I don't see any questions. So I think we can, we can proceed. If anyone has questions, just, just, just ask. No worries. Okay, so now this seems difficult as it is now, but I'll try to translate to put back what Susie and Mary on this slide and let you understand what's going on. Okay, so first of all, Susie and Mary are in our story are two persons, right? But in a neural network language, is Mary and Susie, the critic and the painter, will be two neural networks, right? The painter is a neural network that will produce some image as output because you know that the painter paints something, right? And critic is a neural network that gets an input, get an image and produce an output zero, one. So the probability that this, the input, this image is fake or real. Okay, so the generator will be the painter. It will be Susie, okay? So you can say that the generator, this X fakes will be the image. Okay, that the generator that is that, that's name that we will give to Susie, the painter will produce. Okay, now you may wonder here, you see this noise, right? Variable here. And what is this noise? Is actually, you can, you can imagine that the painter has to have some ideas. I will paint uh, a landscape, I will paint a portrait, I will paint, uh, I don't know, some flowers, right? Van Gogh painted many things. And how you decide what to paint. So we use some noise that would actually play the role of the creativity of the painter, saying that if you change the noise, it's like the painter decides to paint something else. So given a certain noise, some numbers, right? The, the generator, the painter will produce some image. And changing the noise, it would be maybe one time it would be flowers, and maybe one time it would be a portrait and so on and so forth, okay? So the generator is something that gets an idea as input, random noise, random numbers, in, in when we have to code something, right? And produce an image that is this, uh, this thing. The discriminator will be, of course, the second network that we have, and will be Mary, the critic. So it will be something that takes an image, this X real, and produce this Y hat that would be you remember there would be a zero or a one, right? The probability of being in a class zero or one, okay? So the real will be this image, a real. You remember that in step two, the critic Mary has to train to get better at recognizing. So she has to see some real images to get 
better, right? And the X fakes will be the fake that the painter has produced, okay? And now, for example, this would be the step one. You remember that in step one, we had the painter, Susie, that actually wanted to learn how to paint, right? So she painted fakes, right? The fake, she showed the fake to Mary, right? This is, would be this network here, this, this arrow here. So Mary, right, show this image to this, the discriminator, that would be Mary. Mary would say, you know what? The probability that, that your painting is real is really low. It's really bad painting. There is no way that nobody would think that is Van Gogh, right? And so the generator or the painter has to get better in some way. And how it gets better is trying to minimize this loss function. That is this cross entropy. So how far I am, or how far is the opinion of Mary from a real? If, the, if it's really far, I can use back propagation and all those kind of algorithms that some of you may have heard of and try to change the parameters of the network that in this example would be the ability of the painter so that she can get better. Okay, that would be the step one. And just let me get back just a second. You remember that's the step one? The painter paints something, show it to Mary, Mary comment on it. And we go back here, right? This is exactly the same thing, only done with neural network. So you have the generator produce an image, show it to the discriminator. The discriminator says, this is the probability of being in class one. And then the generator trying with back propagation that is an algorithm to actually optimize a network for a certain output, right? So try to get better. But you remember that there is also step two, right? Because Mary the critic has to get better, right? So what Mary is doing is taking also some real images, right? Remember, you, you will have a data set of real images that you want to kind of create something similar to, right? So it takes some image, the discriminator will look at the image and just produce an output, right? And then again with the, uh, with the loss function, we'll see, you know what? I want to, to get better of, or of, at saying that image is real when it's really real. And I want to be better at saying that the image is fake, right? This is the label zero is for fake when the image is really fake, right? So you sum the two and you try to minimize those two because if you minimize those two, it means that when a fake come in, you will say it's zero. And when a real come in, right, image, you would say one. So, and you do this step and again, you update your ability or in neural or in neural network language word, you update the parameters so that the networks does what you want. So that the critic becomes better. Okay. You interrupt and, you. Uh, there's one person raising his hand yes. or her hand. Maybe you can ask your questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. So uh, just uh, when we go to the very beginning of the training, uh, what do we have in hand? We have the uh, model and uh, we have the data set of real images. Yes. So your data set, you will start with a data set of, of some, let's say Van Gogh images, real images. And your goal is to create a generator or to train a generator that produce images as similar as possible as the ones in your data set. Okay. And this generator, uh, when it is starting out for the first time, so it will produce some uh, black and white means a uh, very fundamental noisy image it means very, very noisy image. I'll show, you. I'll show you. That's correct. At the beginning, it just produced noise. That's correct. So, and for, but the man, but they also, the, you think about that the critic would be also very bad. So at the beginning, it will be mostly a random, you know, whatever. It could be a real one because she has no idea, right? Random pixel values, yes. I'll, I'll show you an example when we look at the code, uh, how it looks like a generator before starting to train. But that's that's yeah, absolutely yeah. correct. It produced just random ones. Yes. Oh, okay. I mean, it's amazing that it actually works. <laughs> but it's uh, um, it produced noise and uh, and it's it takes a while uh, and. I think that's something to point out, uh, just that it relates to this question, is, is this kind of, 
you know, because for example, one question you may have is the following, why we need to do this step one, step two, step one, step two, step one, and step two, and why we don't get, for example, a discriminator that we train beforehand so that it's really good at telling, you know, like real from fake and just use that. And the problem is that the experience shows that when the critic is way much better than, than, the, than the painter, this training doesn't work because the painter don't learn much because the critic is always saying that it's fake. So he never make a mistake. So there is no way for the generator to get better. And it's really important that the, the ability, let me phrase it this way, that the ability of the generator and the discriminator kinds of grow together. Because if it don't, if, if the two don't grow together, the training is really, really inefficient. And this is why you are doing this step one, step two, step one, step one, step two. Sometimes you do one step one and multiple step two or vice versa, depending on the problem you're trying to solve, but you really are trying to, to keep the ability of the two parallel while they, while they grow, okay? And so this is why your question related to your question, because when you start and the generator just produce white noise, right? If they, you know, if they, the critic would be perfect, it would always say it's, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake, right? And so it would be very hard for the generator to know what, how to, to, to get better because you imagine it in this way, right? Thanks for elaborating on this. And actually there's another question in the chat now. Um, so the discriminator has no way to tell the generator why it thinks it is fake. Is there any possibilities for it to give more specific feedback to increase the efficiency? Mm -hmm. um, so how you, you actually develop is, uh, no, you don't give specific um, feedback in the sense like, uh, you know, the colors are not right, for example, something like that. Because the, the only thing that the, you can actually how you can get the generator to become better is actually updating the parameters so that the output is what you expect it to be. But the problem here is that the generator doesn't understand language like uh, images and uh, or regions because the input of the generator is just a noise vector. It's just one, for example, 100 value of random numbers. And then it generate an image, but he has no way. Typically, if you consider, for example, convolutional neural networks, there's no way of actually changing only the colors or changing the shape of something. It's more um, producing something, whatever it is, that actually fakes the discriminator here. So, at least is is now there is no no easy way to to translate features that we humans understand like colors, shape or size or style, not easily put it back in the, in the generator in this kind of, uh, this kind of approach. It's like the style transfer. There are ways of having loss function that describe style. And then and so that the styles, for example, if you, uh, if you, if you, if you've heard about like uh, neural networks learning to paint, right? Take a picture and the output is something that looks like a painting. That is called style transfer, but that's a slightly different concept. And you have like loss functions that actually try to, to capture, uh, for example, textures and, and other things, but not in this case. And there's another uh, follow-up questions uh, from Wicom. Um, so now with the binary cross entropy loss function, it can not be very specific because it's just one or zero, but maybe is it possible to combine a bounding box prediction into the discriminator loss function? Um, yeah, you could actually use different loss functions. Uh, it depends on uh, how you define real or fake, right? Um, you, may, you may, of course, use um, loss functions that uh, are um, at different components. So bounding box, for example, prediction would be more for, a, for example, this is typically used for localization of something in the image. So depending on what you want your generator to produce, you may use different loss functions, right? Uh, for example, if you're looking at, uh, um, I don't know, super resolutions and other things, uh, you may you, you use slightly different uh, loss function depending on what you define real. So how you can measure that, I mean, is something is real or what kind of, what the critic should tell you, 
and uh, you can use different different ways but uh, when you are just saying that oh you know what i want an image to look real then you typically try to do something like that but uh, you surely use you can use uh, uh, different loss function. I, I may search for examples, and uh, and if, if someone is interested, can get in touch with me. I can search examples and send it to you if you want. If you're interested in seeing different things, but I would have to search for specific examples. But it depends on a bit on what the the generator should produce and how the discriminator actually what the discriminator means when it says it's good or it's bad. That's basically the, the idea. I mean, for example, I mean, just, just just to conclude this discussion, if if you would like the generator to uh, to take an image and just center the image, you may want to use something that actually measure how centered the image is, right? So it, it depends a bit on what you want to do. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, so I think I can go on. Uh, but but there are good, very good questions. So. so and and this is actually the main idea so you do this step a and step b right and and i'll show you in the code how you do that okay um and and basically this is now uh, uh what i'll show you later is this is just a piece of code and i don't know how many of you i'll show you with it it will be bigger and you will be able to read it but basically in the code, I try to use the same notation so that you will see, for example, here when I talk about X fakes, is this image, right? And this generator, and I'll show you discriminator are two functions that returns the model, the Keras model. And if you don't know what that means because you are not in computer science, if you never use Keras, don't worry. Just imagine that this generator is something that produces this image. And these generated images are just images that are fake. Okay, just, just imagine that. And we go through the code and you can use maybe this slider. I'll put the slide in the in the GitHub so that you can check it. And you will see that when, when we look at the generator laws and discriminator laws are exactly are exactly the formula that I showed you. So this formula, what I'm showing you here, it's actually implemented one to one in the code. It's ex you will find exactly the same function, the same formulas. The same steps exactly the same as you see here so if you look at the code and you look here you will be able to map everything and for example um you may know mnist data set this mnist data set is a famous data set i think that is like the hello world of machine learning everyone has seen it probably way too much it's a data set that has seventy thousand handwritten images and the code that i have in, in the in the github is using this data set because it allows you to download it online without having to download gigabyte of images and it's even if the images are really small like the 28 and 28 pixel and they're in gray levels it takes forever so it's if you use larger images it will be really long training that you will have to do but with this one you probably can get something in probably a couple of hours on a laptop and for example those are digits that are have not been uh, actually written by a person but they are were generated by a generator that have been trained exactly in the way that i showed you so you can generate like you can basically if you want to say you, you could say that that the neural network has learned to write numbers if you want okay so now maybe some of you have noticed something that i've not touched directly yet and uh, what i've not touched directly not have discussed directly is the fact that as you know if you take this as it is as i depicted now it will just produce for example one number let's say this uh you would take them this data set then this data set have numbers from zero to nine and it will produce one number, but you have no way of telling the generator to produce a one, a five, a seven, a three, a two, or any class for that matter. It just produced one random class because there is no way for the generator to, you know, to decide. There is no no distinction. He doesn't know or she doesn't know, you know. If, for example, in, in our example, Susie doesn't know if you want uh, to have like a landscape painting of Van Gogh, you have no way. You have to try and try and try until the landscapes come out. But you have no way of telling Susie, you know what, please paint me a landscape of Van Gogh, okay, as it is now. So, and those are the classical uh, general, the generative adversarial networks. 
There is a slightly, so no, there is a famous actually uh, variation about the GANs that are called the conditional generative adversarial networks. And the conditional general adversarial networks are actually networks that have an additional input that is the class. So that while you are training, the idea is actually almost the same. The only difference is that, you know, you say, for example, the generator draw me five and you ask Mary, the creative, to just look at fives. And you do this kind of step one and step two in the same way. And you choose randomly and you say, you know what? Now let's pick a three. And then ask Mary, look at this three and just get, please get better at looking at trees. And, and not trees in the sense the plants, but trees in the sense of numbers. But uh, you get the idea. So, and you can do the, exactly the same thing. And the, the code is very similar, and you will find an example in the in the in the repository, but it's slightly more complicated to develop because you have to to change the structure of the network. And this is for those of you who have seen a network before. Just I wanted to show you, for example, that this, for example, would be the the input of the one hundred. Sorry, I, I thought just something some some echo, but it's fine. Um, this, for example, would be the input for the 100 noise numbers. And this one, you see this one here, it's simply something that accept one number as input, that would be the class, for example. And then you go, you go there and, and, and you merge the two. So you start and you take the class here, for example, and, and you, you can find example, uh, and, and here you get the noise, okay? Just to give you an example. And the, and the critic, is exactly the same. Of course, what you're looking here is a, is a conditional GAN that was published. So it's actually been optimized. So you may wonder why you have those intermediate later layers here, but just because it has been optimi optimized, but here you, you have an input one and you have an input of the image, right? So the discriminator is telling you if the image of that class is fake or real. Right, and you go again, step two, step one, step two, step one, and so on and so forth. Okay, and that that's the main idea. Okay, so if you go here, the, this is actually the main fundamental idea about adversarial training, um, and it's uh, it works almost always the same. For example, in super resolution, you may, for example, instead of noises input, you may have a low resolution image, and the X fake would be the high resolution image, for example. You could do variation about that. Okay. You could have, for example, those kind of things to color again black and white photos, right? You have the input is the black and white, and the output, the fake, is the colored one, right? You can, I mean, the, the only limit is your imagination. You can use it for almost everything if you have and a big enough data set that you can use to train the two networks. Because if, when the two networks are big, you know, you need lots of data lots of parameters so that it's the kind of problem you have. And it takes quite a while to train those networks, especially if you're working with images that are large. Okay, so again, so the MNIST 28 by 28, 784 pixels, it takes forever on a laptop. So it takes like half a day, okay? And yeah, sorry to interrupt you again. And we have um, a question in the chat. Yes. So what is the loss function for discriminator of a conditional GAN? It checks both real fake it's as well. It's always the same. It's always, the, you can use this one. You can use the, the, uh, the cross entropy. Okay. And uh, Arka three, and I think you have a question. Uh, maybe you want to unmute yourself and ask it directly. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. I have a, I have a question. Um, uh, so, so, so the, the guns are good, uh, but uh, when you do guns on uh, black and white images, how, how can you can you can you uh, move from from one channel in the picture to to three channels to to go from black and white to to images with the picture with the colors? Uh, and the, the second question, uh, can, can you tell us how you could, you can do style transfer uh, with uh, with guns? Do, do do you use guns in uh, the style transfer? For example, uh, have uh, an image and make it smile, or uh, or for example, uh, in landscape uh, make it uh, from summer to winter. Uh, and th that's the questions. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, thank you. You're welcome. So to answer your question in the order that you you asked them. So first of all, how you move to colors? Well, actually, you know the, the fake image here, right? It, it's actually doesn't need to be one just with one channel. You could have a network that actually start from 100 numbers, and instead of getting to 28 by 28 times one channel, you could go to three channels, right? And the, the difficulty, of course, is that the, the, the generator it will take more time, it will take more images, but you basically can produce anything you want here of any dimension you want. It doesn't need to be an image. I mean, for example, you may decide that you want to produce some kind of instrument measurement data with more information. Right, and you have some real, and you want to produce. For example, one thing that guns are used for, for example, in in, in medicine, uh, there is a lots of research going on in trying to produce fake patients based on a certain set of features, so that you can use those patients to uh, as a data augmentation technique to actually use on, for example, classification um, algorithms to 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 make them better because you have more data available. So it's actually, I, I use this example of the Van Gogh painting because it's something that it, it's intuitive, but you can think about this x fake as anything you want. So it could be a table of numbers. It could be a one dimensional spectra. If someone is studying physics, for example, you could actually use it to generate optical spectral measurements of stars in astrophysics. You can use it uh, for so many things. So that, that is just a matter of, uh, creating the generator so that the output has the right shape. Uh, regarding the second question, typically style transfer, typically is not done with guns, um, is actually done in the following ways. You have an input, you have a picture, and you have an output, you have the, uh, you, you want to have the, the painted version of the, of the image of the photo that you have as input. And what you actually are doing, you're actually minimizing loss functions that are measured, like the try to measure the difference between the style and the, and the textures between the two. And, and you, you need the, like an example image. I have an example, so it takes a bit longer to explain it, but if someone is interested, I can, uh, uh, I can send you an, a link to uh, a notebook that I, I've used to, to teach convolutional neural networks, where you can actually upload your, your profile and actually get like your portrait painted by Van Gogh if you are so inclined to so you can paint it uh, you can say that Van Gogh painted your uh, your portrait is probably would be very easy to say that it's fake but you can play with it a lot and you can see really like in real time like every every epoch how it gets better and better it doesn't work with every image or with every painter but uh, it's uh, I can I can maybe well I think otherwise we don't have time. I'll just hurry up. But afterwards, maybe in the in the questions, I can show you an example if you're interested. Um, okay, so that would be for the slide. Uh, let me just show you quickly. Um, let me see, share the screen again, and then let me. I think that I can share. Yes. Okay. Now you should see uh, you should see a Jupyter notebook. Is that correct? Very yes. good. I make it a bit bigger so that that you see. If it's still too small, let me know. So, uh, just to give you before you start anything or you want to run something, keep in mind that it takes a while. So on a laptop, it can take two minutes for each epoch and you need probably a thousand epoch or so. So it takes a while. Okay, if you if you run it on, go, on call up, Google call up, you can run it on Google call up. So you can simply upload it in Google call up and let it run there, but it still takes 30 seconds or so per epoch. And unless you have a dedicated machine, maybe at the Technische Universität in Munich, you can use something, it may go really, go down in time if you have dedicated machines. Okay, so this is why you see at the beginning this, this NVIDIA part is because the machine I ran on was with three very large like GPUs. So that, uh, so we forget about the, the import because it's probably don't really relevant. Uh, I use this is, I use this MNIST because you can load it automatically from internet without having to download separate data sets. So you can play with it. Um, 
and what I would like to go is to go, for example, here. So first of all, you remember that you need the generator. So this is the, for those of you who knows Keras, this is just a way of defining a neural networks with different layers and different uh, uh, shapes. And don't worry about that. The only thing that if you don't understand it, you need to keep in mind is that this could be anything you like, as long as it takes a certain input for example, in this case would be this input shape 100 random numbers, and it produces an output that is this 28 and 28 times one channel image. What in the middle is happening, up to you. So basically you could play with it, you could make it bigger, smaller, but the thing that is interesting that you may notice is that it starts from 100 value, then he produced an image that is seven times seven pixels. Then it goes to 14 times 14, and then it goes to 28 by 28. So it kinds of grows from those numbers and try to kind of do some kind of uh, uh, make something bigger and bigger and bigger until it gets to the size that you want. So to answer the question of the person that asked about the color channel, you could actually here simply use three and just train the networks to give it color information. It's not a easy, right? Because the training would be longer, you need more data and so on, but it could be done, okay? Uh, and this is actually the just the, the diagram of how the, the network is looking like. I know that we're already at 45, but I'll try to make it in the next five minutes. Um, this is, for example, the output of the generator before being trained. Someone asked about random noise, uh, and you can actually, for example, here, uh, you can actually ask the generator to generate giving some noise right you are you generate 100 values of noise from a random normal distribution and you ask the generator to generate an image before being trained and this is actually the output so this has nothing to do with any number that, that you may have seen in the MNIST data set so the generator has at this point no idea whatsoever what how a number looks like or what needs to be done okay then you define the discriminator in this case it's actually quite a small one okay and here it's you remember it's the opposite the input is an image 28 times 28 times one channel right and the output is actually one number that is the probability of being real okay and this is just again the diagram and what's interesting is that for example you see this discriminator loss. You remember maybe from before that the discriminator loss is the sum of two terms, right? And this is actually the cross entropy is the, the one that we were discussing, right? So you have the real loss. So the cross entropy of, and you, you can actually map that to the, to the diagram that I was showing before, okay? And the generator loss, maybe I can, uh, well, I, we don't have much time, but, uh, but you get the idea, right? So, I showed you that the discriminator loss has two terms and you sum the two terms and those are exactly the two terms that you're summing. Um, and the generator loss is just one term and this, this is why there is just one piece in there, okay? Uh, this is actually the thing that I showed you, right? So you remember this is the discriminator loss. You see that there are those two terms and maybe we can put them uh, together, maybe I have to do it slightly smaller, sorry. Okay, so you see here you have a cross entropy, for example, epsilon phi comma zero, right? And this is, you see, for example, check this out, right? You have fake output. This fake output would be this epsilon phi. And this TF zeros, right? Is simply a tensor that is zero. And this is this zero here, right? Then you have the second term here, Chorus entropy epsilon real comma one. And you take this one, this is the real epsilon real, and this is TF one likes is just one. Just in tensor flutter. Okay. So you're actually really implementing exactly what is in this diagram. Okay. And you see this one, for example, this uh, generator loss function, epsilon fake comma one, is actually epsilon fake comma one. So it's really exactly, if you take the diagram, you will find the code exactly the same formulas. I really tried very hard to make it so that it's easy to map the two. And if you understand the diagram, you understand the code. I mean, unless you, I mean, you have to understand a bit careless, but, but you should be able to map very easily. 
And all the game, all the all the thing that happens happens here. Now in Keras, what you need to know is that uh, you need to use what's called the custom training loops. Um, if if you know what I'm talking about, it means that typically in Keras, when you want to train a, a network, you use a compile fit approach, meaning that you don't even want to know what's happening in the background, right? You define a network and say, please train it for me. Right, but this doesn't work with GANs. It's you need a bit more flexibility, and this is why you need those kind of custom training loop for those who knows what I'm talking about about Keras. But the, the interesting thing is that you really like create the X fake here, for example. You map, you create the, you calculate the Y real, you calculate the, the loss function, the discriminator loss function, you calculate the gradients here. And again, I'm happy to to once to go over how how Keras works with the with the how you calculate the gradients. It would take too much time, but you will see that the basic idea is that it's actually what is in the guy the diagram, and the training happens with that propagation. This is why you need to calculate the gradient. Okay, um, and then you simply let it run. Okay, and you let it run, and you you can see here that you apply the gradient. So, for example, here. What you do is that first you update the generator, you teach Susie how to paint better, you give her feedback, and then you give feedback to Mary the critter. Then you do another look and you do it again, the painter, the critic, painter, the critic, and you can play with it. You can do three times the painter, one the critic, or vice versa, and you can see what's actually faster. Okay. So there are all these kind of, uh, of things that where you actually try to do this kind of uh, alternative learning. Um, and for example, here you see that uh, this is just uh, examples of the network. Okay, they're not that good because I used only 500 epochs, but still it's better than white noise. You can still, for example, the eight is recognizable. There are some that like this one, the second one, I have no idea what it is. I don't know, this is maybe a three, I mean, with some fantasy. So they're not all very recognizable. Um, those are other examples. And you can see that is when you have like, for example, a wide array of classes and you train it randomly, you would probably need a lot more epochs because it's very difficult for the network to pinpoint where the differences are because you are simply not informing the networks about that you're looking at different classes, okay? So this is, for example, a three, right? It was actually, it, it was a random. I didn't choose a three, it was just coming out, okay? Now, if you if you go in the uh, here and you see a conditional gun, so I don't know if I have images, you can run it, this takes even longer. So it takes forever. So just your warn. Uh, but here, for example, you see that I can, I can ask the generator to generate all ones or all twos. And they are much better than the just general one because the networks actually knows a bit more. Okay, I'm looking at two, so I have to learn how the twos looks like in a sense, right? It's like asking Susie to paint only landscapes and so concentrate on features in landscapes that makes them look real, right? Instead of instead of thinking about one's flowers and portrait and, and landscape and, uh, and using, uh, you know, using, uh, I don't know, oil painting and using watercolor and using and so on and so forth. Right. So you try, you get better if you concentrate on a subset of tasks. Okay. That, that would be the idea. Okay. And you find in the code, uh, in the, in the repository here, uh, you find those also the conditional gun that you can use if you want to play uh, these condition guns with Minis is the one that I just opened. You can play, but it, it really takes a while to train. So it, we're talking about the entire night running thing. Okay. So just, just for you to know. But you see here, there are all it's, it's documented, and it's uh, uh, you can, for example, I what I did, I train it and I save it the the, the model in an H5 format. For those of you who knows what H5 format is, it's actually binary format that you can use to save Keras model on on the disk. And actually, you can uh, you can simply load the model in this way. Okay, so you don't actually need to retrain it if you're happy with how the model looks like, and you can ask the model and see, for example, how a one look like, right? And this test generator is just a function that plots a four times four grid of images, but nothing really more. But but the model is available. You can take it, for example, 
And you could even think about continuing training from the point where it started. You can take it and just continue training from there, for example. That could be also something that you can play with. Or you could take the examples that I showed you at the beginning, the general one, but just take, for example, number twos in the data set and just use the twos, right? For example, so that to make it smaller, the data set is smaller, it's probably faster. Uh, you don't have 70,000 images and you can play trying to get things in that way, for example, or you can, there are, there are endless possibilities really. And now you could play with those things. Are there any questions? I think that I just gone over the time, <laughs> about 10 minutes. Um, let, let me, in the meanwhile, while uh, Leander, you check if someone has question, I'll, uh, I'll just check the, wanted to show you the, um, the style transfer. It was a course I gave in London, just a second, narrow transfer. Yes, this one. Yeah, so there's some questions uh, in yes. the chat. Yes. Uh, but may, um, maybe we want to go first with this transfer, slide transfer, and then go to other questions. No, no, we can, we can also look at the other questions. That's fine. So, okay. Uh, what the, so regarding the colors, uh, I, I think the best way of answering the question is if I, if I search for some examples uh, and I can then point out to really like some architectures that people are using. I, I'll note down uh, because I think that uh, uh, guns for colors. So, so what you're in, am I correct? So if I look at the, so Achari, if I'm correct, you're interested in, in uh, um, taking black and white images and coloring them, right? Uh, yes, yes, okay. yes. If it's okay, so if, if you say, if you drop me an email or maybe the other, I can also send you an email and you can forward it to everyone as up to you. I can try to find some examples about how the, the, the architectures look like. I think it's probably the, the easiest way to answer that because in a few minutes it will take too long. I'll, I'll look at Thank it. you. You can uh, send me the link afterwards and uh, I will send it to all the attendees uh, yeah. today in a newsletter yeah okay so what is the exactly the relation between the input noise and the output of the generator if the noise is not random normal will this not work if the noise changes will the output be unrealistic okay uh first of all the um if the noise change the idea is that you get a realistic output for any input noise okay so changing the input noise would change the output for example if you go on the website the, the shows, for example, I think this is, is called like this person does not exist. If you look it up, I think you find it where you actually, every time you open the, the page, a new face is generated. And this is actually the idea. So every time you open the page, a random set of numbers is generated and a new face appears. But the idea is that if the training has worked, you should see a realistic image for every value of the noise. Okay. And if random normal, I don't know if you mean like, for example, things like uh, uh, if it, you use a different distribution, no, it should work anyway. Uh, but the idea is really that you should see a realistic output for every value of the noise. Um, uh, no, 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 no. So, um, so the, also the conditional training is supervised. Supervised. It's exactly the same idea, only you use the classes. You need the classes to know. You need a new data set to know if, if it's real or not, basically, or if it's like class 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Have you tried different losses? Uh, not really, uh, but uh, I've not really done large like uh, guns projects so for different things. So uh, I'm pretty sure I can also look at. Uh, at the different losses for guns and, uh, and try to find different losses for guns. I'm pretty sure that works really well also other losses. And the cross entropy is just, you need a, uh, let's say you need a loss function that, that can, where the, actually the, uh, the critic can say it's real or not, or it's what you expect to be or not. So um, how they become popular or the, the, for example, I think that one of the most famous, that I think I will find also the papers is for example, the ability of generating like realistic faces. Uh, there are a huge amount of reviews about, for example, um, how you get to a point where you can actually create uh, images that are realistic 
been uh, for example you could uh, i i'm not sure i would have to check but uh, i'm you know that for example nvidia is a technology that they use for games that they actually put a game in 4k resolution uh, but the game is rendered at a much lower resolution and then with deep learning they actually up the resolution and i think this is one of the use cases for example that they that they, they have they have used uh, i think that uh, photoshops have probably a few of those in there when you want to like correct things and uh, you want to make sure for example there are uses where you can remove people from from images and stuff like that color images is typical use for images but there are lots of things going on for example again in medicine to, to try to generate new in data set if you are on the newsletter it's probably young guys to help with that um uh yep you you would need upscaling layers yes right that's correct uh, you would need like for example uh, those inverse convolutional there are like different uh different ways of doing that uh, I'll, I'll 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 try to find the reference for guns for super resolution but you're absolutely correct for super resolution because super resolution because otherwise it doesn't work very well if you simply like use normal layers that, that just get bigger and bigger uh, yeah i just i had problems with uh, running out of memory if i uh, use too many upscaling layers <laughs> it depends on the machines you have uh, uh you, you st this is why i was saying that you really need like large machines when you're doing those things i don't know where you run it uh, or how much memory you have you, did you have also gpus or yes i ran it on a gpu okay how much memory does, does it have i think it was already 40 gigabytes so it was yeah. quite a lot but it was 512 times 512 pixels then, so it, it was really large so yeah, yeah, yeah it worked it worked with 256 but uh, nothing beyond that yeah. i mean if, if you drop an email uh, if you have something that is quick i have a machine with three gpus with 48 gigabytes each Maybe one can go a step further it would be interesting to see yeah that. yeah i think it's better to uh, start with low res and then afterwards yeah. upscale I think yeah, it, takes, it takes huge amount of time memory and uh, it's true this is why i was saying that keep in mind when you try something that it takes time um if you train your guns on only one class is it as good as condition training uh that's a good question i one would have to try probably i would say that if you train enough probably yes but you would probably have to to test it depending on the problem you're trying to solve Okay, so the next event, yeah, that you may inform them later. Uh, I wanted just to, to show you quickly regarding the, the style. Uh, you, you should see, for example, um, this is, for example, those are very small images exactly for the reason that, uh, that was mentioned before, because otherwise it takes forever. And this was done on a hands-on session on a workshop. So I needed something small. And you see, for example, the style image is a Van Gogh painting. I like Van Gogh. I'm sorry, you always use Van Gogh. And the, the left one is an image. Now you will see some cypresses in the image. That was not, it's not like a random event because if you choose similar images, it works a lot better. But you, you had really like to, uh, oh, wow. It doesn't work very well. Let me, let me refresh it. Okay. I don't know why it doesn't work, but do you also see it flickering, right? Let me, let me just use, let me just, sorry, let me just skip to Chrome because I'm using Safari on the Mac and it's, we should, Now let me share again the screen. I'm sorry. Uh, so Google Chrome. Okay. Now you should see my my screen again. Yes, looks good. Can, can, okay, very good. And and you can see, for example, this is the picture. Uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, this is the picture, for example, after just a few epochs, I think three. And and this is, for example, the picture after is run for like two thousand training steps so if i all i will also send you a link to this repository so if someone wants to play with it you can also play with it 
and you but but it's the i have also slides for example here if you look at the and just let me just a second uh, let, me, let, me say, let me do it this way and uh, i have also a slide on narrow trans style transfer here that you can check but this is slightly more complicated topic so if you're really like uh interested uh, you can find here for example also how how convolutional networks work what are convolutions and uh, um, more advanced stuff for example the inception models but uh, uh, looking at that i think that there should be also some slides that i have to, I have to search here you see nst that would be neural style transfer you will see like for example the, there are two uh, one is the one for the for the images and the other one is if you want to play for example in you use the content image to create for example this one so for example that you you want to transfer an image only inside another image and it may seems it may seem trivial because you may say that i only remove one color but apparently one of the problems that that um, um, imaging software i have is that the border it comes out really bad because you just get this kind of sharp uh right and with this way you get kind of a very smooth border that works really well so for example you can use neural style transfer also to to get an image and put it exactly on another one for example you can you can do lots of things and um but but that's there's nothing to do with gas this is something that is done completely differently but if someone is curious i Leanda, i can send you the link to the repository people can have a look at it if they want to play with it this is something that should run relatively quickly, so you can put your image in there and just play. You see, there are other uh, things there are, so that there are, are there other. Yes, yeah, so after you send me all the links, I, I will share it with all the attendees uh, in the email. And also, uh, Umberto, could you also send the slides? Um, yeah, I will put them in the, in the GitHub. So mm -hmm. that people can uh, just go on GitHub, and I mean, I can send it to you too, but I can also put it in GitHub so that people can. Uh, yeah, that that's also great. So Ira has the link to the, your GitHub. Yeah. So all the all the notebooks I showed are just free, so you can. It, it may be that you need to, I mean, to create the environment on your laptop, and not not all of them are working in Google Colab. For example, the style transfer, you have to put the email. I mean, you have to know a bit how to put where and just check the files, and but it. it it, I, I developed them with the idea that people you don't need to change much but just to change the images and then you should be able to let it run uh and so on uh the models the are ah, the methods from coding competition no <laughs> on the background they're just uh things that we i got from like traveling because we i did uh i do lots of running because i like uh, i didn't win the race i just when you finish a race, they give you a medal, just whatever position you are. I'm typically at the in the last third, so it's they're not coding competition now. Um, and again, so if someone has question or have, I feel free to get in touch. I'm happy to 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 answer questions or help you with I don't know, just maybe answering questions. Training session in Munich. It depends on what you mean with training sessions in Munich. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've done training sessions, not in Munich. I live in Zurich, actually. Uh, I've, I was telling the I lived in Munich. I have several friends. I may come to Munich if you want to meet once. It would be nice if one would, you know, after COVID, maybe it would be possible to do it again. And uh, it would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. And we can definitely have more sessions and events on this topic. Yeah, I mean, I, I have like lots of material if, if you would like to, for example, to uh, to have a, an introduction to Keras and custom training loops and a more, bit more advanced stuff. We can also do that. It, it may take slightly longer than 45 minutes because it's otherwise it's it's sometimes it's difficult to to pack everything in there, especially if you start from scratch. But but it, it's if some if people are interested, we, we could do that. Yeah, if you have my email, you can we can get in touch. So there's uh, a couple of questions on Slido as well. Um, but maybe before we go to Slido, is there anyone still want to ask questions? Maybe you can unmute yourself now and ask it directly. And um, if not, then let's start with the Slido question. So I'm, I'm looking at those. 
Okay. So oh, maybe... uh, these are very generic questions. That's a good yes. question. Um, the most common use cases, I think we mentioned a few. Uh, and I'll try to find uh, maybe a couple of review papers so that you can see really all the possible uses. Uh, drawback, drawbacks or weaknesses. Well, one drawback of, of GANs is, uh, um, I think that would be surely that you need lots of data to work with those. So this is uh, because you want to create something realistic. So you need to show the networks lots and lots of images. I mean, if you're working with images or with, uh, with examples, but, uh, um, and, um, and they're not easy to train. So they're not easy to train. For example, the problem that I mentioned about the fact that you want the, the skills of the tool to remain kind of the same while you're training, it's easily said, but it's not easily done. Very often one gets really better than the other and then suddenly you don't learn anymore. So it's they're not easy to train and, and it requires quite some hardware typically to train it. So the, the, I think that uh, I have to show you because this person does not exist. I want to show you. I'm, because I, I always try to, okay, there is this story that you go on this person, uh, let me just, um, just a second, let me share just the screen. I'll just take five minutes, I promise. Uh, now you see the screen? Okay, so now this, for example, is, uh, is actually famous GAN, it's called style GAN that generates spaces. And it's quite amazing how good they are. This person is not existing, but you can play this game try to find things that tells you that the image is not real. And if you look on the background, for example, I don't know what this is in the, in the bottom right corner. The wall is very strange. The face is amazing, right? Uh, but, but there are sometimes there are, for example, problems with, uh, with earrings and hair. So sometimes I play, if, if you are really bored, for example, you can play this game and just refresh it and try to, to identify, to find image. For example, the head is really strange, but it may be true, but, but the face is, is quite amazing, right? Um, this is, yeah, that's also good. Uh, that's also good, the background could be, yeah, maybe the, the left ear is strange, but apart from that, it's very difficult to find, but there are some that are really, not good. For example, the reflection in the in the in the glasses could be strange, right? I don't know. Um, this left face is really creepy. I don't know what that is, but you can see that the left face is really creepy. And uh, this is quite good. The hair is really amazing. This is also don't see any problem. And you can play this game. I mean, I don't want to keep you like twenty minutes watching at faces, but. You get the idea. So th those are examples how good they get. But to train this kind of thing, I think here if you go here, you you find it like the original papers, and it's there are quite there are quite some uh, tricks that they use to to get to this point. I mean, it, it, you may think it's not it's maybe it's not very useful to generate faces, but it's actually from a purely engineering point of view, it's quite an, uh, an interesting result. Yeah, that's and, really interesting. And yeah. Actually, I, I have a follow-up question on this drawback. I've heard there's some critique on uh, GANs that it's, it is not that creative um, because it's just tried to create images that are similar to the training set. That's correct. And it may lack the creative aspect. And I, I saw there's a paper about creative uh, divisorial network on the art. I'm not sure you have, whether you've seen it. Um, so besides Besides uh, um, the signal of discriminator, besides it tells it's true or false, it also tries to tell uh, which classes of, uh, so it's an art painting, the, uh, the paper. It also tries to tell which uh, style of this art is. And if it's hard to group it within a art style, um, then it seems to be more creative than the others. So I want to ask, what do you think of this um, critique of uh, creative aspect? I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, there is one thing that I, I, I always say is about meta networks is they are typically, I mean, they are very stupid, right? What I mean is that they, they learn from the data they have been shown, right? So if you show Van Gogh paintings, they get, so basically, neural networks 
get really, really good at one very specific problem, right? And what, they, what is not yet possible is to transfer those ability to other contexts. So if you say, for example, you know what, you, have, you are really good at, at copy paintings. And I mean, if you take a painter, right? Let's say you take a, a forger, someone that is really good at, at faking paintings. Probably he's so good or she's so good that she can probably paint Monet and Van Gogh and, uh, and different painters in some way, right? And, but if you take an error method the lens that they're only seeing Van Gogh, it will only paint Van Gogh, whatever you do, right? So, I mean, I mean, we can discuss philosophically what creativity is, but surely something that is true is what you say is that a neural network will reproduce the thing that, that has seen, right? And so if you, if you show, I mean, you can of course show more and more and more painting, but it will be always be limited at that. So it will never happen that the network will come up with a completely new style. Because yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, at, at least as they're trained now, maybe in the future, this will change, right? Uh, but, but for the moment, uh, I, I, I would say that this, this, the creativity, this is why I was saying this 100 noise vector. I, I kind of say that it's kind of similar or goes into the direction of the creativity in the sense that it's kind of the idea, right? That I paint the landscape or flower, but it's a bit of a stretch really, to call it the creativity. But, and, and to answer also, I see that your question goes a bit along the one that you can have a model that detect fakes. Well, actually what I, I presented the idea about like creating a good generator, but your goal could be creating a good discriminator, right? You could also uh, have a, as a goal, something to use guns to do, uh, to do that, exactly those kind of things. Right? And there is a lot of research, for example, those adversarial attacks where, you know, for example, they try with the Tesla um, narrow networks where they put like stickers on, on, on speed signs and the, the, the Tesla was completely recognizing something different. And you can actually use those kind of things trying to, to see if the, what was recognized is correct or not. There is a lot of research in, in that because it's, of course, a risk when, you, when you're driving a Tesla on the and then a car just makes it the wrong decision. So you can use the discriminator, you can use in event. So going back to the creativity, I think that the person that is developing those models can be really creative in how they can use it, right? And it doesn't need to be exactly what I say. It can be, again, you can be interested in the, in the discriminator. It can be the discriminator you want to, to recognize that there is an object in the image, a cat or a dog or whatever only. Or you can really be like, I mean, there are really no limits in how you can use this approach. So I think that that's the, the, the creative part. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing. And there's a last question on Slido. So in which scenarios you would advise against using GANs? Um, well, I, I don't know exactly. It depends on what problem you're trying to solve. I mean, generating faces has no consequences, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's OK. Maybe the face is not good, but uh, it's not really. Um, I mean, I would probably say that instead of advising against using GANs, I think that one would have to be really careful about how or let's say to use it in cases where you have like consequences. For example, if you use GANs to do that augmentation, one would have to be really careful in analyzing if the results of, for example, additional models using those generated data sets from GANs are really behaving maybe in a fair way, or if the results make statistical significance and that kind of, uh, uh, of questions, right? Um, I, I think that there is no real, like, uh, just one answer, right? Um, but uh, apart from the obvious, as, as, as I see in the chat, obvious illegal, like, uses, like, creating fake identities, apart from that, uh, I think that uh, if you use it for, for scientific purposes, I think that the, the thing you have to pay attention to is really trying to interpret the results in a way that you are sure that what you're doing makes sense statistically and that you're not actually um, simply like, you know, like forcing some kind of bias in the models or 
or do that kind of thing because your the data set that you have to, that you've used to train the guns were really limited or were you know like the classical example you only train with white people and then and they, but you want to use it to to use to recognize faces and then you realize that you didn't have enough like uh, maybe people with the skin of different colors and i mean it's those kind of things but it's i don't think that is strictly related to guns i think it's generally speaking i don't know but i don't think there is like a one single answer to that yes hopefully that answers the question and uh we are already close to time and maybe a last questions if anyone from anyone here still want to ask it's your last chance now I mean, I can I can be reached by email. If there is someone yeah, think of a question tonight in the bed, they, they can send it to me tomorrow. It's fine. Yeah. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Umberto, for sharing. Uh, it's it's really informative, and I uh, could learn a lot from it. And also, thank you for coming, all of you. And I was really surprised by the interactions um, and all your good questions. And um, so. We currently do not have a, 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 a event that's coming up, but uh, since it will be the exam phase, and uh, we will be back in March again for more events for you. Um, and also I want to remind you, currently there's a solution challenge from Google, it's ongoing. So please check their, uh, the page and uh, feel free to start with your project there. And let me maybe quickly share the link to Solution Challenge. Okay, yeah. And um, there anything you want to add, Maria or Andrea? Uh, we will most probably do uh, an event about the Solution Challenge. So if you have already a project, maybe would like to consult your idea with some experts, then you maybe uh, you can look forward to that session. Great, thank you. And yeah, we will also send uh, the link uh, from Battle in the newsletter. I will, I will send you maybe tomorrow. I don't know if I managed tonight, but I will send you like the links about the, the style transfer and all the things that I mentioned to you. Yeah. And you can add it to the newsletter. And I will maybe I will all yeah, and, and I will put the slides on the on the GitHub. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining and wish you a nice evening. Uh, you too. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank really you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.